So welcome back uh, everyone to the JDG. Uh, this is our seventh uh, meeting for Trinity term. Uh, and we have the pleasure today to be joined by Professor uh, Justine uh, Lacroix, uh, who is a professor uh, at the Free University of Brussels and is uh, here with us today uh, to present a reflexive and political conception of human rights. Justine, thank you very much. Uh, for accepting our invitations and being here uh, today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share the screen. Uh, okay. Okay, so. You can see me. Okay. Um, so, uh, wait a minute because uh, well, it's better like this. Okay. So, here we are. So, thank thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted uh, to have the opportunity to to discuss uh, this work, which is a work in progress, with you today. Um, I, I don't think uh, that uh, you're all familiar with my work. Uh, so uh, maybe let me uh, introduce very really briefly uh, what I have done uh, recently, as this will help to set the context. I used to work, say, between 2000 and 2010, uh, after my PhD, on the political theory of the European Union. And then in 2010, I started a new research project on the different phases of the critiques of human rights since 1789, with a view to deepening the current debate on the relationship between human rights and democracy. Now, 10 years ago, when I began working on the critiques of human rights, it seemed it would be only of interest to broaden our knowledge in the field of a history of political ideas, which was obviously a sufficient justifica justification in itself, at least for an academic research. However, I sometimes found it difficult to convince people that it was also a, a topical research. And uh, in fact, there was an agreement at the time that we were living in what was called the age of rights. Human rights had established themselves as our last utopia, to take the title of Simon Moyne's book, published precisely in 2010. So this very brief reminder uh, makes it possible, I think, to measure the extent of the reversal that has taken place over the last 10 years. As you know, uh, everywhere, increasingly powerful currents are challenging the constraint, especially at the international level, the constraints that result from the guarantee of fundamental rights. Now, uh, from a political theory point of view, uh, this uh, recent distancing <laughs> this recent distancing uh, from the language of human rights in the public sphere uh, is less a surprise because uh, in some ways it can be seen as giving broader voice to critics of human rights that have run through various schools of political and legal philosophy for over 40 years. And uh, in the book I, I published with the uh, French philosopher uh, Jean-Yves Franchère in 2016, which was uh, translated as Human Rights on Trial in 2018, uh, we identify uh, two main, uh, two major critiques of human rights coming from opposite ends of the political spectrum. The first critiques uh, of human rights is that of, favor is that of favoring a form of social fragmentation. And the second critique is that of distracting us 
uh, from social emancipation. As you know, and I won't develop it uh, further here, but as you know, in the last two decades, let's say, uh, more and more prominent scholars and public intellectuals have dismissed uh, the ideals and the achievements of, of human rights law and advoca advocacy as elitist, top-down, apolitical, bureaucratic. Moreover, uh, human rights are, of, are sometimes said to be perfectly compatible with a radical inequality. They would play their part in legitimating the statu quo, which today appears as the dominance of neoliberal individualism. Now, what can political theory do to address these critiques? Well, it seems to me that uh, one needs to combine several disciplines, law, history, politics, philosophy, to try to provide some answers to this criticism, while at the same time accepting the share of truth. And actually, uh, in the recent period, uh, some legal scholars have responded to these critiques, showing how human rights advocacy has been and can still be an effective tool for social justice. For my paper uh, and my reflection shares these authors intentions and intellectual motives, its method is different and hopefully complementary, since my aim um, is rather to elucidate the normative and the historical resource embedded within the language of human rights. More specifically, at the end of our human rights on trial, Jean-Yves Franchet and I advocated a political and reflexive conception of human rights, which draws uh, heavily on the works of Anna Arendt and Claude Lefort. The latter, uh, the later, a French philosopher who died some 20 years ago, more or less, is far less well known than the former, at least beyond the French speaking world. But is one of the most insightful thinkers of rights and democracy. And uh, precisely, maybe the, the simplest way to describe uh, what this political and reflexive conception could be is a sentence from Claude Lefort, when he defined human rights as the necessary or not sufficient condition for a world habitable by all. In other words, uh, if human rights alone do not constitute a politics, they are still politically significant. They are not a politics, they open it for possibility of several types of politics, ranging from the most demanding social democracy to the most cautious liberalism. And uh, what I have tried to do uh, in, in this paper uh, is to show what this political and reflexive, reflexive conception could be from a very concrete example, that of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. So uh, maybe um, a, a few words about this choice. I have to say immediately uh, that I am not at all a specialist of the Charter. Uh, I'm not at all a specialist of the case law of the European Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, so to explain where this paper comes from, uh, last fall, I was invited uh, by a group of Belgian lawyers uh, to a workshop celebrating the 20th anniversary of a charter. They wanted uh, a philosophical perspective on, on the text. And at first I was tempted to, tempted to refuse uh, because I felt so incompetent. But then uh, I took a closer look at, at, the, at the text and I, I realized that maybe there was something to say, uh, there was a few things to say from a political theory point of view about this text. And I will, uh, in, in my presentation, argue uh, that the charter reveals actually two aspects of human rights that are not often highlighted. Uh, the first is the recognition of the conflicting nature of the interpretation to be given to human rights. And the second is a conception of human rights that sees them as constituting a common world, a social world, a world of equals. Uh, 
So first, a few words about uh, the charter itself. So as I uh, um, uh, uh, one might say that 20 years after its adoption, the charter uh, uh, is actually little known, not to say largely ignored by academics who do not belong to the circle of lawyers or specialists of the EU. Um, and it, it, this is, um, it seems to me, however, that the charter includes resource that could perhaps open the door of interpretation to other understandings of human rights than those that have often prevailed at the European level uh, over the last two decades. So this may seem paradoxical because at a first glance, uh, the Charter seems to encapsulate the two main critics of human rights uh, I've just mentioned, that of favoring a form of social dissolution and that of abandoning the promise of emancipation. One could even read, read the Charter as exemplifying a neoliberal conception of politics, which aims to remove the principle of market freedom from the field of public deliberation. Suffice it to mention uh, the free movement of service and capital mentioned in the preamble of a Charter, as well as Article 15 and Article 16, which make the provision of service on a European scale and the freedom to conduct business fundamental rights. Beyond the text, the use made of, uh, the use made of Article 16 by the Court of Justice of the European Union in recent years has armed of a European polity which often appears to be more concerned with maximizing individual interest than with asserting principles of living together. In other words, the charter would be part of a logic that leads to replacing the principle of emancipation with that of a simple individual capacity to act without interference, quoting Alexander Zemeck. Now, uh, should we leave it at this first reading? I'm not sure. And let us remember here the very famous uh, critique made by the young Karl Marx uh, um, of the 1791 declaration. Well, you all know this citation, the selfish man, the man as a member of a bourgeois society, separated from his community, withdrawn to himself. Well, actually, Marx was not entirely wrong, uh, perfectly aware of a letter of a text, the conditions under which it was drawn up and the political interpretation given to it, he had maybe not forgotten how as early as 1791, the Declaration of the Rights of Man was explicitly invoked in the Le Chapelier Law uh, to ban workers' association. However, if Marx's critique was not false, it was incomplete. As precisely uh, Lefort has shown, Marx failed to see that human rights were not merely a veil masking class relation, but the arena for the symbolic institution of society. Marx took the bourgeois discourse on human rights, on individualism and private property to the letter without realize, realizing that the language of rights induced a dynamic as social agents with new demands appear. What uh, Jean Jaurès, a few decades after Marx, Marx understood as follows in this wonderful uh, cita cita quotation, uh, I know well that in the declaration of the rights of man, the revolutionary bourgeoisie has slipped an oligarchic sense, a class spirit, but I also know uh, that from the outset, the Democrats use the right of man, of all men, to demand and conquer the rights of suffrage for all. And so uh, uh, from the outset, the human rights um, had a deeper and broader meaning than that given to it by the revolutionary bourgeoisie. The riverbed was wider than the river. So it seems to me uh, precisely that in the case of a charter, 
to the riverbed is wider than the river. And more precisely, as, as I said, uh, a careful reading of his text highlights two essential aspects of human rights. The first element is the implicit recognition of the always conflicting nature of the different interpretations uh, of a relationship to be found between freedom and equality, or of the meaning to be given to the concept of human dignity set out in Article 1. In view of certain parts uh, of a text, it would be uh, possible, uh, as I said, to stick to a neoliberal uh, reading of the European model. But this first impression is immediately contradicted by the ambitions and the precision of chapter four on solidarity. Actually, one can say that this title paves the way for active solidarity across borders between those concerned by trade liberalization. It may serve then as a basis for rules limiting the commodification of men and things, quoting uh, Alain Supio. Uh, in other words, even a rapid reading of the provision of a charter shows that the vision of a monolithic European polity that would be entirely dominated by neoliberal folk does not stand up uh, to analysis. Uh, the texts show very well that different policy options are, are, uh, um, are at hand. Now, uh, this tension between the different parts uh, of the text uh, perhaps illustrate the first characteristic of what could be the European model. Far from being an homogeneous community united around supposedly consensual and specifically European values, Europe should conceive itself as the locus of a confrontation between different conceptions, libertarian, liberal, uh, socialist, radical of human rights. And the charter could then become uh, an effective weapon for defending conception over than the internal market in the construction of Europe. It should be see the, the, the case lay low uh, of the uh, European Court of Justice uh, could be seen as taking pla place in uh, what uh, Kerstenberg called a wider deliberative process. But uh, such an approach would, uh, however, imply taking leave of a form of, of claim to scientific objectivity in the interpretation of human rights. And it seems to me that in this respect, the proposals made by some authors, such as the introduction of dissenting opinion on the model practice at the US Supreme Court or at the European Court of Human Rights, or the even the possibility of parliamentary alert relating to the decision of a court of justice would perhaps enable more people beyond the community of lawyers, uh, uh, would uh, enable more people to become aware that human rights are inevitably open to divergent uh, readings, which must be debated in the open. But this uh, would mean assuming uh, the political dimension of human rights, which would mean assuming that human rights are not ultimate principles from which the rules of social life can be deduced, but rather, quoting again Lefort, the symbolic matrix of a regime based on the legitimacy of a debate on the legitimate and the illegitimate, a debate necessarily without guarantee and without term. Now, the second singularity of the Charter, compared to other national and international instruments for the defense of rights, lies in its openness towards an interpretation of human rights that does not reduce them to the rights of individuals, but conceive of them as constituting a social space, a common world. Let me again mention that uh, it is precisely this ident identification of human rights with the rights of the individual that Claude Lefort criticized both in the Marxist and the liberal conception of human rights. And Lefort took the example of freedom of opinions, which makes opinion not an article of private property, but a true freedom of relations 
which binds the subject to all the subject in a shared public space. Now, the fourth argument was not just that rights may have collective implication, that would not be very original, but his theory is really that human rights have always contained a social meaning, that of the discovery of a transversal dimension of social relation of which individuals are the terms. But differently, the, the emergence of society as such and that of individual rights are, two, are the two sides of inventing political society. Now, to come back to the charter, uh, it seems to me that the, uh, this re relational dimension of human rights is indeed present in the pe penultimate paragraph of the preamble. Enjoyment of his rights entails responsibilities and duties with regard to all the person, to the human community, and to future generation. It should be noted that it is a significantly uh, different wording uh, from that found in Article 4 uh, of the 1789 Declaration. Uh, liberty consists of doing anything which does not harm others. Uh, again, as you know, um, in um, Marx again pointed out by, that by def defining, defining freedom as the right to do all that does not harm others, the French Declaration invited everyone to see in other men and women, not the realization, but the limitation of their freedom. This freedom was, he said, the freedom of a monad in on itself. Now, in the paragraph of the charter uh, mentioned uh, uh, here, the affirmation of rights is posed as inseparable from the inclusion in a common world from which we are co-responsible. Better, better still, this common world is not limited to the citizens of the EU, but it extends to humanity as a whole and to future generation. So this could be maybe an opportunity to move away uh, from the vision of a subject who could free himself or herself from collective responsibilities and to move towards a relational conception of human rights. Now, uh, actually, in a recent article, the, the French lawyer, uh, Edouard Dubout, also discerns uh, this notion of a relational subject uh, not in the preamble, but in certain judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union, which refer to the Charter. Uh, on several occasions, he points out, the Court has stated that relation of dependence, uh, vulnerability, particular vulnerability, of, of those relating to the need to meet basic needs, were all, all elements likely to trigger European protection. And so uh, he, he mentioned uh, several judgments, but especially this one. And this is perhaps, Dubu points out, the beginnings of an alternative vision of the European model, which would es escape the dichotomy between radical individualism on the one hand and national collectivism in the other, in favor of a certain conception of relating to each other, of in uniting with each other. Now, this consideration uh, of the intersubjective dimension of human rights is certainly uh, essential. However, uh, the fact that this recognition of social links by the Court of Justice takes place under the headings of vulnerability, dependence, and weakness give also rise to some concern. And the, the question um, uh, we can ask what can ask is here is, does this uh, case law uh, really stem from a form of social humanism, or is it merely part uh, of a more general expansion of humanitarian reason, which leads uh, to a shift in focus from human rights to life to be saved, and thus to the substitution of taking into account the suffering of victims for that of building a common world of equals. As uh, Didier Fassin has shown, uh, the, the today prevalence 
of vulnerability as the universal foundation of a precarious and fragile human condition is not without ambivalence. The very word, uh, word uh, precariousness actually refers to the idea of a favor and a dependence on the one who has the power to give, thus maybe distancing us from the construction of an autonomous subject. When they are not minors, the men and women referred to in this judgment appear less as actors fighting for equal rights than as victims whose weakness and dependence legitimize the initiation of a protection mechanism. Hence the risk um, that this case law may become part of the more general phenomen phenomenon of ethics replacing politics and humanitarian emergency replacing the demands for social justice. And so uh, the, uh, this insistence on vulnerability might then seem to reinforce Samuel Moyne's questionable, but it might seem to reinforce Samuel Moyne's thesis that human rights movement, as they have developed since the uh, late, uh, late 1970s, have replaced the demand for equality with a simple inspiration for sufficiency at the risk of being nothing more than the uh, poorest companion of neoliberalism. Hence, uh, the interest of, uh, in focusing attention on another element that could, at least in the French, Italian, and Spanish version of a charter, be mobilized in support of not only a relational, but also a political conception of human rights. This is the notion uh, of person mentioned in the second paragraph. All the more so I, it is, as it is directly linked to the notion of citizenship. So it, the union, plays the person at the heart of its action by establishing citizenship of the union. Uh, to be honest, I don't know, uh, I should know, but uh, I, will, I, I, I don't know at this stage why the term person is mentioned only, as I said, in the French, Italian, Spanish version. In English, person is also used in the articles of the charters, but not in the preamble. In the preamble, it's the individual. And in German, it is uh, mensch, the human being. So, very different concept, and this is a fascinating question, but I leave this issue open to come back to my concept of person. So certainly this concept of person was chosen with reference to the Christian conception of a human being, but it is not impossible to think also the Latin meaning of the word persona, the mask, uh, as analyzed by Marcel Mauss in his famous 1938 article. And in revolution, Anna Arendt also recalls that this, this mask had two functions for the Romans. He had to hide or replace the actor's own face, but in a way that made possible for the voice to sound frog. Of course, the question for Arendt was not to establish a dubious link between ancestral persona and legal personality. It seems to me that her uh, analysis was more aimed at highlighting the social implication of rights. Without the persona, she wrote, all that remain would be an individual without rights and duties, perhaps a natural man, but certainly a politically irrelevant being. In other words, if people uh, are to consider each other as equals, they need a public space of appearance that make their actions and words meaningful. So it seems to me that this concept of person is an invitation to articulate citizenship to the exercise of democratic deliberation and to the construction of a public space as the significant passage uh, of the, in the human condition uh, makes clear. Uh, the police uh, is not the city state in its physical location. It is the organization of the people uh, as it arises out of acting and speaking uh, together. So for, for high men and women who act politically are not natural human beings, but characters who wear masks. Um, without this mask uh, that makes human being a person, they are reduced to their vital and organic function. And politics is no longer the place where the equality of participants is built, but the place of physical vulnerability and compassion. Um, 
And uh, so recalling this Arendtian use of the person seems to me to have the advantage of linking the rights of a charter to the conditions for acting together. The other point in mobilizing Arendt is that this world of, world of equals cannot be confused with no, the national form as these quotations makes clear. Make clear, makes clear, sorry. <laughs> now, um, of course, it could be objected to this uh, reading of the concept of person, but it only applies, uh, as I said, to the French, Italian, or Spanish versions of a text, and that it uh, certainly does not correspond to the intention of a text authors. But once again, uh, uh, my aim here with this maybe naive reading of a chapter was above all to open the door uh, to alternative interpretations of human rights. So I believe uh, this is uh, precisely uh, where the folk of Arendt, uh, combined with others such as Claude Lefort, Etienne Balibar, leads us. Indeed, Arendt was acutely aware of the emancipatory potential of the Declaration of Rights, but she also knew that they were at the same time ambivalent and unpredictable. So it seems to me that her fault uh, and those of others should allow us to elaborate a political conception of human rights. That is uh, to say, first of all, a reflexive conception that takes account of a per perversion the lexicon of human rights can engender. And um, I, I, I John, as uh, Etienne Balibar uh, has, has written, uh, actually a politics of human rights should all, always be a politics of a second order. I mean, a politics of politics, taking into account the implication uh, of uh, and the implication of the principles. But at the same time, this political uh, conception uh, leads us to uh, uh, emphasize the rights and their democratic creativity. Thank you.